256. Hymn number 256, It Is Well With My Soul. Hymn number 256. <laughs> first because I think that there are some foundational concepts in understanding uh, the doctrine, and it is a doctrine, it's a teaching in the scripture about Bible separation. And those doctrines, I think, really help us to understand um, a lot of things about worship. And so I believe that that did be a good foundation, a good beginning uh, for learning about worship. If you're in Isaiah chapter 6, I'd like to just read our text this morning, and then I have quite a few things to say uh, that some, some of which I'll try to repeat on a weekly basis so that we can really tie together the concepts that the Bible teaches and about biblical separation. I'm glad you're here this morning, and I would urge you, 
if you uh, know of other church members or if you have friends that you know could be helped by the series that we're in. And you'll understand, I think, by the time we're done this morning, a little bit more of how people could be helped by it. I would urge you to invite people and uh, to recommend for them to be here. And so we're going to just really kind of introduce ourselves in Isaiah chapter 6 this morning to this truth. Uh, we are going to begin in verse 1. This is Isaiah giving a testimony about an experience that he had with God. It's in the year that King Uzziah died, saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain his, he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Now you know the word twain means two. The word twain means a couple. So with two he covered his face, two wings. So the seraphim had six wings. Two of them covered his face, two of them he covered his feet, and two of them he flew with. So I, I don't know if you're artistic or not. I'm imaginative, but not artistic. In other words, I wish I could draw what I imagine the seraphim looks like here. I have seen drawings that other people have done, and I've never liked them. I've never felt that it did because it hasn't matched what I've imagined. But I'll recognize these seraphim someday. I will look at them, and I will, uh, from the description, the scripture, uh, description in the Word of God, say, okay, six wings, two over its face, two uh, covering his uh, feet, and two wings he's flying with. And so that's, anyway, the, in verse 3, though, this is where we really come into our context this morning. The Bible says, One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The post of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now this is not God speaking, but literally the one who cries has such a thundering presence that literally the place shakes. Isaiah's response, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Father, please, this morning, help us to understand biblical separation because of holiness. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, before we expound our text, before we just look at the particulars and details like we ought to do, and then before we make application of it as we need to, I want to just introduce the topic of separation. Now, separation obviously carries with it the, the idea of being separate from, right? So separation is taking two things and separating them. So things that are together and uh, separating them. <laughs> separation and unity seem to be at odds. In other words, if we're unified, we cannot be separated. If we're separated, we cannot be unified. Those words seem opposites. If I were going to ask you on a um, scale of 1 to 10 to rate the words on the basis of which word is the most positive, and by the way, they're not against each other and they're not opposites. We're going to see that in our series on separation. But if I were to rate, ask you to rate the words on the basis of positivity. Is positivity an actual word? People use it all the time. I hear it all the time nowadays. Positivity. Pos some people, somebody wrote me an email last week about positivity. We need to have positivity. It may be. Uh, you know, I, I think that the word is a made-up word about being positive. Okay? But the word positive... And uh, positivity being the vibrations that positivity gives. Will you please rate for me the word unity 
on the basis of its positivity. On a scale of 1 to 10, is, uni is unity a 10, a 1, or where at in between? Which word, uh, I mean, the word unity, would you say, is that, that a word that has a lot of positivity about it? Should. Yes, right? Yeah. Should. Should, it should certainly should, at least to the generation in which we live, in which unity is everything. You know, the kumbaya, holding yeah. hands and dancing around the fire, you know, all in unity is positive. You know, it's just camaraderie, oneness. There's no war in unity. There's no displacement. There's just mm, good feeling. So, one to ten, unity? Yes. Positivity. Okay. Separation. And separation being people from each other. Would be a what? One? Zero? I heard a one and a zero. Okay, Tosh is going to give us a ten. And now he's going to tell us why. I mean, it could be a ten because uh, you're separated from someone who's unequally yoked from you. Okay, so he's talking about the biblical, uh, one of the biblical applications of separation on the basis of the fact that God says it's right and it's good, then it couldn't be better. And by the way, that's a good position for a Christian. God says it, I believe it, that settles it. And when I apply it, it makes sense. Let me just tell you that this series that we're on, that we're in, about biblical separation, my friend, is not one bit negative. I'm not preaching separation because of what we're against. I'm not preaching about separation because of who we're against. And it's not because this is my take on separation. It's because inherently within the teaching, the Bible doctrine of separation, we find some things that are incredibly positive. And we're going to actually see them today in our context. We're going to see from Isaiah chapter 6, and I hope it whets your appetite to be able to say, okay, I understand what separation is, and now I want to know how to do it. Uh, I want to know how to do it God's way because it is such an amazing concept. I'm just telling you, as a believer, it's one of those concepts, biblical separation is, that actually is so incredibly, not only eye-opening, but just gives us such a grip of who God is and what God has made us to be that it literally opens doors and, and if you'll apply it and you'll use it in your life, actually connects people that could never have been connected in a way that you just wouldn't believe in. So it's an absolute pause, absolutely a positive series. This is not... Uh, I, I have listened to sermons on separation where uh, men are railing and ranting against evil and against things they're against. And I'll do that. Uh, I'm, I'm against evil. I'm against bad stuff. But, I, you know, sometimes they're talking about, you know, against Christians that they're against and, and uh, different you know, different movements and so forth. And by the way, I'm not against that, but it does not catch, it does not catch the heart of separation, the heartbeat of separation. Separation is one of the most positive Bible doctrines you'll ever understand and embrace, and that's a fact. It's one of the most positive things. I don't separate from anybody because of anything negative. If, if I practice biblical separation, you're going to see today from the Scripture that it's something that not only reflects the character of God, but it's a positive thing. Okay, so here we are in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is unique among the prophets in that he had a ministry somewhat different from other prophets' ministries. First of all, he lived a long time, which wasn't typical of prophets. Most prophets had pretty tough lives. And most of them didn't survive very long. They were either put to death or killed or persecuted to where it just wasn't healthy for them to stay alive very long. They had short, limited ministries. And Isaiah actually was a prophet for during the reigns of some kings of Judah. Let me read them from uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, he would have been in Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. So he would have been the prophet during uh, the span of four kings reigns. So four kings came and went during the time in which he served Israel, or Judah and Jerusalem, not Israel, but the Judah uh, as a prophet. And so he would have been somewhat different in just his longevity as a prophet. He had a lot of contemporaries. A lot of the other prophets would have been alive at the same times as Isaiah. 
Uh, Isaiah's prophecy was very, very unique in many senses because in Isaiah are many of the prophecies about the Messiah, about Jesus, Jesus Christ. Isaiah and Jeremiah just prophesied so much about the Christ who would be born. And you know those pass some of those passages of Scripture. Isaiah's ministry was unique as well in that he actually had full... He, he first of all came from nobler bloodlines, if you'll, if you'll permit uh, the, the uh, concept this morning. That is, he would have been related to the kings. He would have been a relative. And uh, he would have not been like Amos was a, uh, a uh, not, not a fig, but a, uh, what was it, kind of tree, sycamore tree, root sycamores or something like that, a, a farmer from Tekoa. He would have been sort of a uh, ignorant redneck farmer. Yeah. Would have been Amos. Uh, Isaiah would have been sort of connected or related to royalty. So he would have uh, been a, <laughs> permitted a classier prophet, if you will. He would have had some class. And in spite of the fact that he prophesied the truth and he was a true prophet, he actually had access to the palace. Most of the time, prophets came, prophesied, and then ran for their lives. You know, thou well, art the man. I'm out of here. You know, he tell a. You know, if you could think of Elijah and Ahab in their relationship in Israel. You know, Ahab says, "God do so unto me and more." If your head is on your shoulders at the end of the day, you know, and he's out of there. You know, I, Elijah calls down fire from heaven, burns the prophets of Baal, and uh, um, Jezebel puts out a bounty on him, and he goes and hides in a cave. You know, read the Old Testament sometime. It's fun. Okay? But, I mean, that's generally the nature of a prophet. Is prophesy, thus saith the Lord, and then run for your life. Or just get killed. One or the other. But, that, but, but Isaiah, he would have had access to the palace and would have been related to the kings and would have had the privilege of prophesying in a time period when actually the kings were concerned about God and actually receptive to God's Word, God's message. For the most part, not in, entire, not in its entirety, but for the most part, Isaiah, as a prophet of God, had the privilege of prophesying in an era when there was a heartbeat for God by the kings of Judah. And it would have really been a nice time to prophesy, actually. And so the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said something happened to me. And actually, this would be, in Isaiah's ministry, one of those points, one of those encounters with God that I think probably changed him forever. In other words, he was already a prophet of God. But this would have been an encounter with God that really gave him a, another level of understanding of who God was and what his calling was as a prophet of God. Now, how many of you have been in church sometime and you know heard the, you know, who will go for us and who shall I send? You know, and the motivating message of God's calling you, and are you going to volunteer, and are you going to follow Jesus? You know, this is a great, you know, call people into the ministry kind of a... By the way, VBS is next week. Who will go for us? And who shall I say? <laughs> okay. Uh, but in other words, how many of you have heard this passage of Scripture? In other words, we don't preach all the way up to... We read all of it, and then we preach who will go for us, and whom shall I send? But actually, there is a doctrine that's being taught that Isaiah is explaining, and it's doctrine of separation that's in this passage of Scripture. And that's really the teaching here. That's actually what's there more so than the last phrase, which is just the conclusion to everything that Isaiah describes. So he saw God. Isaiah saw, saw heaven, saw the throne of God high and lifted up, and he saw these, these uh, seraphim, that were around the throne, and if you can, if you can imagine it, and again, if you're a person who draw, like Tony could draw this. Tony's one of those artistic guys. He wouldn't draw it right, but he could really actually draw it, and uh, he could, he could kind of make a seraphim, and you know, six wings, you know, two covering his face, two covering his feet, and two flying around the throne with. Like this is kind of something, isn't it? And and then this angelic being, one of them, uh, they, they, the Bible says they cried one to another. Uh, and so they're seraphims. I don't know how many there are, but the whole time they're shouting out to each other, Holy! 
holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, when we see in the Bible a word used three times is for sake of emphasis. It's a, it's a way to describe or to say that the thing cannot be more so than it is. In other words, God is not just holy, but He's holy, holy. God is not just holy, holy, but He's holy, holy, holy. To the utmost or to the extreme, it's a Hebraism to really help us to understand that this is just a major concept and a major truth. Now, can you imagine this just the scene? Just the activity that, you know, I don't know if you could hear the wings of the seraphim over the over the throne and uh, covering their covering their eyes, covering their faces, you know, probably because of the holiness of God. You know, it's just literally God is so holy they can't look, and and uh, there's there's smoke in the around the temple, and just this the holy nature of God is just causing this scene, and then this voice that cries out about the holiness of God, and literally the pillars are shaking in the temple. Like, this is moving. I mean, I can't describe it. The Scripture describes it beyond uh, probably what we could visualize. Can you imagine having being Isaiah and trying to describe what you saw here? I mean, it, God, the Holy Spirit really helped him with this, didn't he? Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've already got a good visual as far as this is a dramatic, moving scene, and it's terrifying. It's absolutely frightening. It's absolutely terrifying. I would not want to wake up and find myself here. <laughs> You know, in this in this kind of a scenario, I'm not being sarcastic or silly. This I'm just telling you, the holy character and nature of God is terrifying. And then we see in verse uh, in verse four that the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So even the seraphim had a voice that made the doorpost shake. Not God, the seraphim. So. <laughs> I mean, if these are just angelic beings around the throne of God, and the seraphim have this kind of a... Like, can you just imagine, like, they're moved, they're moving doorposts with their cries. And Isaiah said, Woe is me. Now, the word woe means I'm just stricken. I see it as, you know, just a... Oh, I mean, just literally a, a physical collapse. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I've frightened people enough that they've fallen down before. I just, you know, you, try, you ever try to scare somebody and you actually succeed? You know, you're trying to, and then you realize, why well, I kind of overdid that just a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I have scared people badly enough that they've just fallen down. And, uh, you know, so I know this whole, like, you know, you ever just had your, your knees are shaking? Uh, I didn't do this on purpose, but I scared Melissa real badly one time in our house. I, a man gave me, he had gone hog hunting, and he shot the biggest wild boar I've ever seen. Just a uh, massive looking, mean. Have y'all ever seen a wild boar with the big tusks that come out? And the things that literally kill anything. Nothing messes with a wild boar. They're fierce looking. And a guy had a... Now I'm going to have to tell two stories uh, that don't have to do with God being holy, but they, they, got, they happened to us. So this guy had shot one, and he was moving, and he had all these mounts. And one of them was a wild boar. He had a couple of deer and some, you know, like prairie dogs and squirrels. Not squirrels, but different bird mounts. And he gave them all to me. And uh, I had a whole bunch of these, and I used them for all kinds of stuff. I pranked people with them all the time. Uh, this wild boar was so fierce looking. I mean, you just look at him. Mean, I've seen wild boar, and they look, you know, pretty or cute or a little mean. This one was just terrifying. And so he gave it to me. I was tickled to death to have it, so I came home and hung it on our living room wall. You know? And <laughs> Melissa got home from teaching school that day. Pardon me, my cufflinks are coming undone. Melissa got home from school from teaching that day, and she walked in the door, opened the door, and walked straight at it but didn't look up and went down the hallway. And uh, it was a shotgun style, not shotgun style, it was a ranch style house. So you have a living room and you have a hallway that goes this way. And in the living room on the wall would have been the wild boar. So she's walking up the dark hallway this way. The wild boar is on the living room uh, door right here. And she's walking down the hallway. And I came in the house, I think I was getting her things out of the car or something. And I came in the house and she was just spinning. 
She was just going, like, oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> In a circle, I just basically collapsed and had to grab her. <laughs> she had seen that wild boar, and it looked like it was just coming out of the wall, <laughs> like right there. And uh, just terrified her. I mean, just really, really scared her. Then <laughs> we were scaring our, uh, our teenagers. We were doing a... Um, we did. We would do every summer a, a boys' sleepover and a girls' sleepover, and our, for our day camp. And it, you know, it was the girls' job to try to scare the boys, and the boys' job to try to scare the girls. And then, so the the counselor that was with the the guys had me get together some things. We we basically built ourselves outfits, you know, that matched the boar. And I had the boar head coming out of me, and then we had them up in Boynton Beach. To get to the beach, you had to walk through like the sea grapes to get to the onto the beach. Yeah. And so they've been out on the beach, and one of the counselors have been telling the kids scary stories about this like guy that looks like a you know a wild pig, but he's got a man's body, and you know that sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, we set up lights inside of the inside of the sea grapes, you know, to hit us just at the right time. So the kids are walking in, then. You know, the wild boar, we, 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 we did it smart because we lost kids before. So we figured out a way, you know, to box them in, to make them run from person to person. So we had three people. So they could just, you know, run back to the beach or run forward. So you scare them this way, scare them this way, scare them back and forth, right? So somebody who looked like a wild boar, you know, with a sh big shadow behind them, came out at the, at the boys in the trees and, uh, you know, with a fierce roar and... Uh, boys started to run this way and run that way, and then they just collapsed. <laughs> they just fell down. All right, that was a little bit funny, but where I really scared somebody with that thing, <laughs> it was totally accidental. That was on Saturday, and we had scheduled our van to, to have a front end alignment on Monday, and so I took the van to a man who was pastor's friend who had a mechanic shop in Boynton Beach, and um, had it get had it, asked him to align it, dropped it off, and I came back in the afternoon to pick it up. And when I came back to pick it up, his name I think it was Larry Forbes, if I remember, it was the guy. And he said, "It was really funny what you did to me." I said, "What did I do?" He said, "With that wild pig." I said, "Oh, yeah, I forgot I left that in the van." He says, "Yeah." He said, "I had fun with that thing all day long." <laughs> so, I had left it between the seats in the front passenger seat of the van. So he gets in the van and starts it, and he looks down, doors shut, seat belts on, and it's right here. I'm coming out at him. Just he said, I hit everything trying to get out of that van. And then he drove our van around town all day long to all the other shops, to all his friends, and had them look at the, you know, a problem where it looked like a heater core was leaking on the floor or something like that. And he pranked his friends all day. He said, well, there's a pretty fierce wild boar. Anyway, uh, my brother has it. It's in Kansas now. But uh, I'll use it on y'all someday. <laughs> I've scared people. I've, I've been frightened. I'll tell you, when you're really, really frightened, you know what you do? Like when I'm really scared, I try to kill something. Uh, that's what my wife says. But uh, when somebody's really, really frightened, they just collapse. And that was what Isaiah did. Literally, he saw the throne. He saw the seraphims. He saw the scene in heaven. And he saw God as high and lifted up and he said, oh no, I'm undone. That's God and this is me. He said, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. In other words, when Isaiah saw God, he saw God as unreachable unattainable and he saw himself as wicked as undeserving and as identified with everything wicked and undeserving in other words when Isaiah saw God he said separation separation God's high I'm low God's holy I'm unclean 
everything around God is holy, everything around me is unclean. He saw separation. And when God, Isaiah saw God, he said, there can be no way that I have anything to do with God or God has anything to do with me other than destroying me because of how filthy and despicable I am. Any cockroach lovers here? No. They like cockroaches. Do yeah, you do? <laughs> you do too? One was in my bed. Oh. You yeah. So you just you, you lay him right on your shoulder while you took a shower? <laughs> no, he's out in the ocean now. <laughs> you let him go? Any cockroach? Let me hear like cockroaches. <clears throat> You know, the cockroaches, I'm just going to try to scare y'all. Cockroaches are becoming resistant to things that kill them. They're, they're getting tougher. And they thrive in the worst of places. They come out of those places and scare you. And uh, they're pretty, pretty despicable, actually. I don't like cockroaches, to be really honest with you. Now, they don't do it for me like they do for other people. My wife, ooh, she just, yes, they, they make her sick. Susan, you like cockroaches, though, right? Oh, God, no. Remember when we had that nice one right up here on the ceiling while I was trying to preach oh, no. that time? But, uh, anyways, you don't like them either. So some people are just like, Bleh. you know, if you feel that way about cockroaches, that's kind of the way Isaiah felt about him, that God would feel about him. In other words, when I think cockroach, I think, hurry and get to it and smash it. You know, Brother Lee comes from a family of smashers. His brother David is the king of it. But if, if Lee sees something like a mouse... Run across the floor, he'll get it, man. <laughs> Squish it, he'll be done. I'm going to tell too many stories today if I don't quit. But you know, there's just some things that are just, they're, they're dirty, nasty little vermin, and they just need to be. <laughs> One thing a cockroach has never resisted is a good stomp. They just, you know, they still crunch and splat. You know, and all that ooze comes out of it. <laughs> Isaiah felt like a cockroach. I mean, I mean, way more than that, way more extreme. But if you want to understand what he felt like he was to God, he just felt like God, I just smash me. I felt that way. Anytime I really look at God, I just think, you know, God, especially when I'm when when I'm not right, I'm not living right, and I just. I just think, God, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I am so despicable. I am so unworthy. I am so disgusting. I am so, ugh. compared to you, hey, how many times has God ever sinned? Zero. Zero. Never. How many times has God ever come close to doing wrong? Zero. Zero. Never. How deserving is God of veneration, worship, and holy living? He's all deserving. And I mean, any. Anybody that comes into God's presence really just deserves judgment there. Just deserves to be treated like what they are. And Isaiah saw God in heaven. He was high and he was lifted up. and The whole scene was holy, holy, holy. And it was such a dramatic thing. And all of it served to help Isaiah understand, I'm unclean and I'm unworthy and I'm undeserving to be in the presence of God. And God's going to get me. Separation. Separation is actually the reality of what God is and what we are in our natural state. And my friend, here's where separation gets positive. Separation becomes beautiful. Here's where it just, it just when you understand biblical separation, here's where the, the light switch ought to just flip on. You ought to see the light. And you ought to just say, wow, this is the most lovely of doctrines. This is the most beautiful concept that I've ever seen. In verse 6, then flew one of the seraphims under. Would that be scary? These six winged creatures crying, Holy, 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 with a voice that shakes the doors. Then flew one of the seraphims under me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. Now, don't get, don't get ridiculously literal here. He's not trying to burn his face off. But he took the altar as the place where things become holy, you see. The altar is the place where the sacrifice of the lamb is, is made. The, 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 the altar is the place where things are purged and are clean. And it takes a coal from the altar of the, uh, of the from uh, a coal from the altar, and he touches Isaiah's lips with it and says, Lo, this hath touched thine lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And all of a sudden there's no more separation. Friends, sin is what separates us from God. 
That's our unholiness, our wickedness. That's what separates us from God. And when Isaiah saw God, the first thing he thought of was his sin, his iniquity, his wickedness. The first thing that when he really saw who God was, Isaiah said, God is against sin, and that's the very definition of who I am. In other words, God hates wickedness. God hates sin. And He's terrifying. And I am wickedness. I am sin. The seraphim takes a claw off the altar and he touches Isaiah's lips and he says, this has cleansed you. This has cleansed your iniquity. And all of a sudden now, the very thing that separated God no longer exists. Now guys, you know the picture here. This is the cross. This is Jesus. <laughs> This is the sacrifice. This is God's perfect Son who never sinned, becoming the very thing which is the exact opposite of who He actually is, becoming my sin, becoming your sin, being nailed to the cross, dying, taking His blood, His life's blood, and going into the throne room of heaven and laying it down and saying, there, a perfect sacrifice for sinners. And God taking that blood and covering us with it. And making it so when he looks at us, he does not see the sinner, he sees the blood. Cleansed. Cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. That's Isaiah's picture. You're wicked, but you've been cleansed. Your wickedness separates you from God. But the altar has cleansed you. And now you're clean. now you're separated from everybody else. See, before you were separated from God and identified with everybody else. Now you're identified with God and separated from everybody else. Is that a bad thing? Well, what about everybody else? What about everybody else? See, my friend, if I've got to be separated from something, don't separate me from God. I need God. Separate me from my sin. Separate me from the wicked. But don't separate me from God. That's what I need. But what about the wicked? I'm not better than them. Not better than they are. I'm not different than they are. I've just been cleansed. Been cleaned. Then, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, and before he heard the seraphim, he saw the king, the Lord. Now he hears the Lord. It's interesting, isn't it, the progression? I don't want to make more to it than the context says. But before Isaiah heard the seraphim, now that he's cleansed, he hears the Lord. And I think there's a little something there for us. The Lord said, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And said, I hear my, send me. Okay. Isaiah's wicked, he's separated from God, he's been, and he's identified with the wicked. So he's connected with the wicked, he's separated from God. Now he's been cleansed, and he's separated from the wicked, and he's identified with God. God speaks and says, Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. Oh, look. <laughs> Here am I, send me. And he gets sent to the wicked. But he's not the same as they are. He's sent as one who's been separated unto God. Who's trying to bring them to the same place. My friend, listen to me now. Separation does not cause you to withdraw from the wicked. Separation causes you to identify with God and then be sent to the wicked. 
The difference is, before you're separated or before you're identified with God, you're just like the wicked. Now, you're identified with God. You're completely different than the wicked, and you're sent to them as one who's different. Listen to me. The lack of separation in our churches today has been a wholesale disregard for the reality that we have something to offer the wicked. The lack of separation in our churches today says, we're just like you. The same things you do, we do. What you want is what we want. The way you live is how we live. We're just like you. And my friend, for people who are in despair and who say, I can't go on any longer like this, there's no help and there's no hope in that. Listen, an unseparated Christian is a Christian who can't help anybody to see God. An unseparated Christian is a Christian who looks just like the wicked and he says, we're just the same as you. Guess what? If they're dying and they're dead and their trespasses and sins, and you tell them you're just like them, you can't help them. See, biblical separation isn't about you're no good. I'm better than you. Get on your side. Stay there. Because I'm different than you. No, it's a I was unclean, but I've been cleansed. And you're unclean, but I've been sent to tell you how that you can be cleansed. This is funny, uh, but, but, it, but, it, but it illustrates, and it really um, brings this home in a way. I don't like to offend lost people. I don't like to, you know, this whole, you know, I'm, I'm holier than thou, I don't like that, do you? Like somebody puts on airs and so forth. This last week we were putting up the fence there, and the, the guys next door really tickled about it. They liked the fence as much as we did. So we tore down their old fence. It was their fence that we ripped down. And uh, they were just trying to cooperate and help us as much as they can. They sharpened our axes, and, and they moved the other cars out of the way so we would not drop trees on them. And, and uh, they just kept coming over saying, can we do it? you want anything, whatever. Well, one of the guys went over to Albertson's and bought us some cold beer. <laughs> and bought them for us. I mean, literally out of the goodness of his heart. I'm, I'm not kidding. He was, he was trying to, you know, it was a gesture. And uh, he brought it to us. I was called, hey guys, want a cold beer? And I said, man, thank you so much. It's really nice. I said, we don't, we don't drink. Really sorry. You know, but thank, thanks for buying that for us. That was really kind of you. Really appreciate it. We don't, we don't drink beer. We don't drink alcohol. Thank you. He said, okay, more for me. He went over and the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> About, oh, I don't know, an hour later, he brought us ginger beer. Non-alcoholic. <laughs> Good stuff, too, from Maine. Looked like beer. Beer bottle looking stuff. And uh, it was great. We drank it. It was good, wasn't it, Anthony? Yes. Our ginger beer, non-alcoholic. <laughs> okay. He wasn't one bit offended that I don't drink alcohol. If I drank with him and he ever needed help spiritually, he'd remember that I drank with him. He'd be like, you know what? He drinks. He's got the same issues I do. I mean, those guys drink all the time. They, they drink till 11 o'clock at night. You know, and it'll cause them, they'll have problems from it eventually. And you know, I hope they know where to come for help. I hope they go to the people that don't have drinking problems. Not better than them. We just don't drink. Why? You know why I don't drink? There's two reasons. One, I hate the stuff. I hate what it does to people. I just, I, on a personal level, even if I weren't saved, I say I probably wouldn't drink. I don't think. But the second reason I don't drink is because the Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby. And otherwise, God thinks it's dumb, and I don't want to do something God thinks is dumb. I don't, you know, in other words, I'm holy, I'm separated. That's all. And you know something? 
I know Christians that would say, you know, he bought you that beer and you should drink it. I know a lot of Christians say, you know, Pastor, you're, you're going to offend those guys. He went over and he paid for beer for you. And it was a goodwill gesture out of the goodness of his heart to try to show appreciation for what you're doing. He was trying to do a kindness. And you don't repay kindness with unkindness. You know, you'd be so wrong about it because you forgot about something. Separation. And it's not negative, it's positive. I'm just telling you, he wasn't offended. I did not offend that man. He said, oh yeah. Okay, yeah, you shouldn't drink beer. He doesn't think I think I'm better than him. I said, thank you. Very kind of you. Appreciate you buying it for me. Thank you. I can't drink that. Why? Because I'm holy. Not holy because I'm good, because I'm better, because I don't drink beer. I'm holy because God cleansed me. Is what God did. My friend, there's nothing more positive than that reality, is there? Separation is not negative. Separation isn't different than you. I'm better than you. You're no good. Separation is I'm different than God, but God made me just like Him. And now I'm different than you. And the good thing is that I'm sent to you. Where separation sends us to the wicked. Not as the wicked. Separation sends us to the wicked as ones who have been cleansed. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? On a scale of 1 to 10. Huh? It's a 10, isn't it? It's a 10. Is there anything more positive than separation? Now, we're going to see the practical application of it as we see how separation is taught in the Scripture for the next four or five weeks. And you're going to see by the time we're done that there's nothing more positive, practically speaking, in the church than biblical separation. Let's pray and let's thank God for what we learned today. God, thank you for what we've learned. Thank you so much for the beauty of it. And I just ask that you would help us in the next several weeks as we begin to apply biblical separation to have a real reflection of what we were and what we have been made to be so that God ultimately we could be sent. Thank you for what we've learned this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning our service is going to be a little different because we're not going to end with an invitation. Uh, if God's spoken to you, He's done business with you, I think you've already just kind of decided. It's already done. So you, it would be perfectly fine or appropriate for you to say, Yes, Lord, to what God's beginning to do. The next several weeks we're going to preach separation and we're going to ask you to make commitments to it. Some of those things. And so if you're here this morning though, I, it would be remiss to close the service without simply saying this. You have to have that experience. You have to be born again. You have to be cleansed. And friend, there's only one way for that. It's to recognize what you are. You're a sinner. All have sinned comes short of the glory of God. You're just like me. You're just like everyone else. You're a sinner. The wages of sin is death. You deserve to be squashed. I don't know a better way of putting it. You deserve to be destroyed because of your sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But Jesus died in our place. He shed His life's blood. And salvation is a free gift that is offered. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you'll cry out to God and just say, Lord, I want Jesus. I want to be cleansed. My friend, you may have a very, very rudimentary understanding of the gospel and of sin and of what Jesus did, but you'll know enough that God will save your soul. And if you haven't made that personal decision, you've never been born again, yeah, the Holy Spirit right now is convicting you about that. He's saying to you, better, better do something about this. You don't want to be living in a state of uncleanness. You need to be cleansed. You'll never be cleansed by the works that you do or by acting like you're better than others. You can only be cleansed by the work that Jesus did in becoming sin for us without having sinned Himself, dying on the cross, being buried and ra being risen again so that we can be risen with Him. Jesus died for you. God loves you very much. And receiving Him is as simple as asking. If you need help with that today, uh, my friend, we're here and we're available and you will answer any question that you have. They're not difficult questions and God's Word has very, very good answers. And you can know for sure that heaven is your home and that you have eternal life. All right, thanks for being here this morning. God bless you, and you're dismissed. Amen.